All right, good morning, Doug. Uh, we're back with another video, and hopefully today's will be published on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, you should know that we were suspended for the last two weeks. So one more strike and we're out, as I understand it. So if you're really interested in making sure you continue to receive information from us, uh, I'd strongly encourage you to go sign up at least on our email list, which you can find at dougcasey.substack.com. So go there if you want to make sure you, if, when we disappear, you'll know where to find us. So. I thought, we'd, I thought we'd already disappeared, though. I thought we Sweet. already had these strikes. <laughs> You're disappointed, aren't you? Well, I, I'm ambivalent. Okay. It won't be long. It won't be long. Okay. Well, good news, bad news, as it were. Yeah. So, uh, so we have a lot of stuff to talk about today, and along with some questions from members of the file. Uh, but I think we should start with the new tradition of what happened this day in history. Got some... Yeah, okay. Um, two things, uh, th three things, actually, that uh, drew my attention looking at the uh, new and PC Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, and just like Western civilization itself started going downhill just before World War I, so did the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, the last edition that they published that was really a masterpiece was back in... 1911, 1911. I've got a set of them. Yes, I know you do. I, I do too, actually, in Argentina. So in Western civilization, well, I guess we both have our sets in South America. So when civilization collapses, I mean, archaeologists will find one edition in, in two separate places. It's a backup system. Anyway, uh, so today um, is Ludwig von Mises' birthday. Uh, 1881, hmm. uh, didn't make the headlines, but it was listed among you know, scores of other people whose birthday is today, 1881. So that's worthwhile noting, perhaps. Second thing I thought was interesting was that uh, they said in their headlines that California was, quote unquote, and they put it in quotes, discovered uh, by uh, Juan Cabrillo in 1542. And I thought that's interesting because in the past it would have said discovered, not discovered in quotes. So why is it discovered in quotes? Well, because there were indigenous living there. But, I mean, these people couldn't read or write and had no contact with anybody outside of their little tribes and all that. But we have to acknowledge them as having discovered it and been there before civilization did. So I don't know where, where, where you could discover. I guess Antarctica would be about the only place that, that Europeans could legitimately discover because it's about the only place where there weren't, you know, some primitive people living. Anyway, it's disgusting, and it's part of the uh, generalized but subtle attack on Western civilization. California was quote unquote discovered. And the last thing I got um, is that uh, this is kind of an anniversary. No, not correct. It is kind of an anniversary, I guess. But the Wall Street Journal had an article yesterday. And do you recall what? Because you looked at that article too. Yeah. What did it say? It said, It said, America finally finds some success in the war on terror. Uh, Clearly, this is an article in the Wall Street Journal that was placed there by a State Department or DOD or both. So the success that they're having in Somalia on the war on terror, quote unquote, uh, is, is that uh, I guess the U.S. has someplace around 500, 700 troops, whatever the exact number is, in Somalia, and they're training uh, local Somali soldiers to fight local bad guys. Now, my view on it is maybe these local bad guys, they probably are bad guys, but that doesn't mean that the Somali government or the troops are good guys. But one thing that for sure, just like uh, is happening throughout the Sahel, is that uh, American troops are going there and teaching these guys how to use modern weapons and how to fight effectively. Instead of just, you know, I'd like natives. 
run around with your AK-47 and pray and spray and this kind of thing. So this is really great. If so, we're successful in the war on terror, I guess, just like we were with Vietnam and Afghanistan and, and Syria and every other place where American troops go. But this is what's happening in Africa. And we talked about this with Niger uh, the other day. Is these, what, The U.S. government is training, arming these African armies and the skills that soldiers are picking up, they're not going to forget them after, after, after they've learned them. And they're going to deploy them, mainly against people in their own countries when they conduct a coup, when the sergeant becomes a lieutenant and then decides he wants to be the dictator. But uh, so this is, you know, the U.S. making trouble and disguising it as being good. It's, it's stupid and it's evil. But it, it's, it's our first success, the Wall Street Journal says, in the war on terror. Well, so, we need one. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. And they'll have plenty of other opportunities to, for, for victories and successes in the war on terror. Especially once it turns inward. I mean, you could argue they already have had some successes with their January 6th convictions, right? Yes. And at some point, all the uh, local Somalis that are going to be killed by these American trade troops and by American advisors, they're going to get pissed off and they're going to come to the U.S. and bring the show home. Hey, you killed my guy in Somalia. I'll kill your guys in the, in the U.S. Logical. You're not saying George Bush was right that we got to fight him over there so we don't have to fight him over here, are you? Uh, au contraire. <laughs> and George Bush should be tried in a Nuremberg style court. And I think. The result would be he should be jailed and his assets should be uh, expropriated to uh, help pay off the debt that he incurred and damages for people that his actions killed at home and abroad. Now he's a you know, Absolutely. Uh, and that kind of relates to another item I think we should talk about because the expropriation of assets from U.S. presidents, past U.S. presidents, apparently... Uh, new precedents are being set with that. And I don't think it's gotten enough attention from people with what's happening with Trump. Now, I don't care about Trump at all. I'm not a Trump supporter. But what they're doing to him in New York courts right now is actually shocking. Oh, it is. It's, you know, the, the word lawfare has been coined recently, correctly. And the people that are in control of the apparatus of the state these current Jacobins in Washington are using anything they can. And of course, thinking about Harvey Sil Silverglade's book, Three Felonies a Day, you know, throwing the book, 92 charges, they're all bullshit as far as I'm concerned. And as far as, um, uh, what's Dershowitz's first name? Uh, Alan, is it? Alan. Alan. You know, I mean, yeah. He's an anti-Trump guy, but he says this is ridiculous and it's criminal what the, what the Democratic Party is doing. But they're attempting to basically steal uh, or misappropriate uh, Trump's assets in New York and elsewhere. Like saying Mar-a-Lago was overvalued at $18 million. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, they, what they, what they're, he's accused of committing fraud by misstating his uh, assets and the value of his assets in this securing of loans. And, you know, the, all of the banks that were involved in that, that profited from those loans have no complaints. Yeah. Um, you know, all the private parties involved are fine with everything that happened. And, and certainly those banks, you know, they don't just loan out money based upon a reported number from the borrower. I mean, they go do their checking and they make sure, I mean, they send people to the property and make sure that those assets add up if they're loaning against them. And I'm certain that they did that. They do that in every other case. So they must have felt comfortable making those loans based upon the information that they had from Trump and then independently verified, certainly by them. And they made the loans and they made money off of the loans. Well, the state's coming back later and saying, he has a track record of fraud, of committing fraud by misstating the value of these assets in a series of things over a number of years. And it basically uh, 
ordered the death penalty for all of his corporate structures. Yeah, and regardless of whether he overstated the assets or not, and I don't know what, what Mar-a-Lago is worth, the number $18 million comes up. It's probably worth more like $180 million looking at comps in South Florida. But uh, the point is here is that it's none of the state's business, or it certainly shouldn't be, what goes on between a, uh, uh, a client and a bank. And it's a civil thing between the two of them if there's a later dispute about things. So uh, this is further overreach on the part of the state. And so, uh, yeah, so what people they recognize that, that, that their enemy in almost all cases is the state as an institution. And once it's captured by these kind of people, it's game over for everybody. Because if it can happen to Trump, it can happen to you and me and everybody listening. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if there are, you know, effectively, they're dissolving the, his corporate LLCs, all the structures, and they plan to assign an executor or a trustee who would then decide how to dispose of the assets. So totally mis or, uh, expropriating them from him and his family. As it's, that's what it seems like so far. And um, maybe they've been doing this for a while. Maybe other people have been the victim of this that we weren't aware of, but because this is such a high profile, it's gotten, you know, it gets national press, a little bit of national press about it, mostly celebratory press from the left and mostly totally quiet on the right. And yes, that's right. And of course, the state has been doing this at an accelerating rate by uh, mounting suits against property as opposed to people. Uh, they confiscate your car and actions against the car, which uh, they take billions of dollars per year. So this is taking it up to a much bigger scale. And you mentioned that uh, in, in those charade debates that we had the other night between these, these non-entities that want to be the Republican candidate, um, none of them. This is a shocking destruction of property rights. And none of these nobodies thought to... Uh, defend Trump, not because they like him or not a good guy, but because this is a criminal injustice. And it, these are totally unworthy people. Mm, no doubt. Not to say Trump is worthy, but it's not even about Trump. It's about, it's about the state has no, shouldn't, the state should not be able to take your assets. Uh, you know, there's not even, there's not even a victim claiming that they, you would assume in a fraud that there would be a counterparty to that fraud. There's a winner and a loser. Where's the loser? Doesn't exist. Yeah. And like most things of this nature, I don't think they're going to be able to walk it back. It's a new precedent that's been set that will be taken forward. So really, really serious stuff. Mm. Did you have anything else on your list? I, I, I might've cut you off a little too soon there. That's all I've got, really. It's a, a slow historical news day. I think. Okay. Well, let me show you something else. And I'm not going to play too much of this because it's just grating on the ears to even hear it. But I think it sets the stage for uh, our for next something that's worthwhile to talk about. And that, let me share this real quick. Now, some of you may have seen this already. There were riots in uh, looting in Philadelphia over the last, over this week, several nights. And uh, I thought this clip summarizes it really well. I didn't say it. Well, it's Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. Everybody must eat. It's about enough of that. So, Doug, I'll say, let me tell you my first reaction to it, and then you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts. My first reaction was, of course, I'm disgusted by the whole the whole scene. It just was revolting to me. And then after that, I think, you know, I guess this is what happens when you tell people that they have been victimized their entire life, that literally the world is set against them and that they're owed something back. What yeah. do you think about that? I think you're absolutely correct. And it's part of the ongoing and accelerating collapse of Western civilization. Uh, and uh, apparently that, that individual, uh, it's a woman, and yeah. apparently her name is Meatball, or that's the moniker. No, really? I believe so. 
That's the moniker she goes by. So uh, there she is in sighting. And good news, I always like to look at the bright side, as you know. And apparently the uh, Philly police did come in there and wrestle a number, a number of these miscreants to the ground, and they arrested, I think the number I saw was 15 people or so on, something like that. Now, will they, they be uh, released or will they be prosecuted by the uh, district attorney? I haven't heard yet. I haven't either, but I think that Philly, that they, that w there was a, a Soros DA in Philly before during BLM who let everyone off, as I recall. Well, we'll see what happens to it with, with, with the scandal. But uh, I know that in Seattle and Portland, two epicenters of wokeism, and all over the West Coast especially, well, everywhere, I understand Target uh, has closed like four stores just in the last few days. Uh, Walmart's closed a few stores. And the stores that were hit here in the city center uh, area of um, Philadelphia, uh, if those stores come back and restock and all that, uh, I, I question the judgment of management, quite frankly, because this is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. After the economy turns down in earnest, uh, these, I suspect these people are going to get out of control. Really, I mean, really out of control. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the economic pain is ramping up, but it hasn't reached its climax, not even close. And when it does, you think desperation and uh, a sense of justice, um, you know, fueling these people is only going to escalate things. Yeah. Yeah. What we saw in, was it Durban in South Africa, where an entire shopping center was totally looted uh, last year? Well, this could happen all over the world, quite frankly. Mm. You know, one of the things that stuck out to me about this, I think it, like I said, my second reaction was it's social justice. And, but my, my, my last reaction or my last thought on it was maybe they're just modeling the leadership they see. I mean, we clearly have a looting political class and a looting financial class. The middle is, follows the rules, works hard, tries to do the right thing. But maybe the lowest caste now sees sees the writing on the wall that the middle class still denies and decides that they should be alluding to. Yes, and maybe it's actually worse than that because uh, this recent scandal, I happened, I'm wearing a t-shirt uh, and have a hoodie with me, which I could put on in imitation of, of that degraded criminal, John Fetterman. Now, the fact that this guy has such bad judgment and bad taste, and he's so bold that he shows up in the Senate on the in, in, in shorts, and, you know, he, he's basically dressed like a, like a bum, and he's a, he's a senator. Uh, this, is, this is just amazing. So people watch that, and they say, hey, there's no limits. You can do anything you want. There's no sense of respect. But listen, this guy was elected. I mean, he was already half brain dead when he was elected. So, and, and it wasn't that he was half brain dead. It's that all the ideas that he talked about, such as they are, were ultra leftist, woke, stupid, destructive ideas, but he won the election. So add all these things together, and the people of Pennsylvania are getting exactly what they deserve frankly, with these riots and Fetterman, I've got no, you know, I'm a great believer in justice and justice is getting what you deserve. So the people of Pennsylvania are getting what they deserve and a pox upon them. Mm. Not a hell, of course, but uh, this is going on everywhere. Okay. All right. Well, we've got some questions from members of the file. If you're interested in uh, our private member community, you can go to file.co and check it out, see if it's for you. And if you have specific questions for Doug, we prioritize those and uh, put them to the top of the list here. So first one, Doug, is this is a subjective question, of course, but he's, uh, he's curious what you think is enough money for both lifetime security and uh, generational wealth? Well, that is a floating abstraction because years ago, 
if you're a millionaire, I guess you were lifetime wealthy. A million dollars was a lot of money. I mean, hell, you could buy a new Ferrari back in the 60s with yeah, seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. So wow. a million bucks went a long way. And you could buy the average house for, what, 50000 nice house, 50000 bucks or something like that. So a million, you were okay if you were a millionaire. But now, I think in order to be comfortable, you've probably got to have like 10 million. Now, why do I arbitrarily pick that number? Well, because prices have gone up quite 10 to 1 since the 60s. But uh, if real wealth, theoretically, could, could increase at 3% per year, which in a healthy economy, it's not an unreasonable number for real wealth to increase that uh, over time. 3%, uh, a reasonable return, just what the economy should do, is $300,000 a year. And you can live on that today pretty well. Mm. Okay, $10 million. You know, but it's going to keep going up. What about generational wealth? What's, what's, what does it take to be, to be able to, what kind of nest egg would you have to have to be able to potentially pass something on that might go for, we have friends who would, that one told me dynastic ambitions really wants his wealth to continue for a long time. What kind of wealth do you need for that? Well, that's nice. Although I wonder about that because just because the, just because your kids are sharing your genes doesn't mean that they're good people. In fact, if you've got enough money to have generational or dynastic wealth, unless you're careful and prudent and really thoughtful, you might wind up with a bunch of spoiled brats that you'd be better off disowning as opposed to giving all that money to. So, but the answer to the question in today's world, let me arbitrarily say 30 million bucks. 30 million. What do you think? I mean, these numbers I'm picking out of the air, are they right or reasonable or what? I mean, I, th I feel the same about the 10 million number. That makes perfect sense to me for generational, like if you're looking like two or three generations for it to last, even if you're smart in the way you structure it, so they can't, it, it just seems to me, yeah, I think it, maybe 30, but 50 seems just feels better to me in my head at it for some reason, but um, it's a lot. Yeah. And it's going, going up that very fast, the amount you have to have. Yeah, it is. And those numbers could change who knows how after the stock market. And increasingly, the opinion of the stock market is, is like Wiley Coyote. He walks off the cliff at this point. It's still there. I think it's in for a fall. So yeah. those numbers could change a lot. And quickly. Okay. Uh, a related question. Um, how much should someone have in savings to call themselves rich? And how much do you think for, to be in the middle class today? Man, middle class. I think you got uh, Well, you know, I like to, it's a question of your point of reference. And I like to think of, you don't know Bo Keeley, do you, Matt? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, you do? Okay. Well, I've not met him, but I've, but I've yeah, seen some email exchanges with him and I've heard the stories. Yeah, okay. So here's a guy who, uh, you know, physically you know, in the top 1% as far as what he could do with his body. Uh, he trained as a veterinarian. Uh, he reads as many books as anybody I know of. Uh, very well educated. A little bit, you know, a little bit off kilter psychologically because of the fact he chooses to live as a hobo with no possessions, basically in a, a hole in the Mojave Desert in California. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Bo's pretty happy. And so, all right. So you don't need a lot. I mean, they say a per it's been said correctly that a person is rich based upon his needs uh, and, and the psychology. And, you know, there's this, this old saying, uh, if you're, as long as your income, say, if you're, if you're outgo, exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Hmm. So 
I mean, Bo is actually building assets and living within his means and, you know, exploring life. So I don't know how much money does it take to live a middle conventional middle class uh, standard. I, I don't know. What do you think? I think it's a lot in America right now. I was, you know, I homeschool for my daughter, you know, Fridays we do economics and I was showing her trying to talk to her about debt today and um, explaining you know, what it is, how it works, all that. And I showed her some, uh, to start it, I showed her four different clips that are from TikTok um, that basically show these millennial age people that are totally fed up and, you know, I mean, fed up and meaning they like they are, they're at wit's end. They don't, they, they can't make ends meet. You know, they have in, in one family, there's a woman talking, she's, a, you know, it's her husband, husband and wife, and they have two kids. And, um, you know, with the student loans and with the car payment and with the insurance and the tax rates going up on our house and all of that, like, she's just like, I don't know what to do. I, I like, I can't make it. We can't make it anymore. And we make, we make $80,000 a year. And she says, if, if as a collectively in the household, which is above the, the national average, she said, if, if someone had told me five years ago that we'd be making eighty thousand dollars a year and be and like have no chance of making it work, I wouldn't have believed them. But here we are. Yeah, and it's going to get worse. And of course, maybe at this point she's got credit card debt, which is now we're talking twenty two percent per year. Or credit card debt, she's credit card debt, and student loan debt. And I think I think what I was trying to explain to my daughter today is, you know, you make a series of decisions early on uh, that build up your fixed cost base that totally end up trapping you and, and, and locking you into a job you might not like or a place you might not like and um, where you have no choices and you feel completely trapped and the walls just close in over time. So you got to be very, and I was explaining, you know, you're, I was saying, I don't believe in stealing and I really believe that, can, that debt and I, I just do this just a hard cold all debt. And I know that's not true, but I, all debt is, st is stealing from your future self. Because most people down the road, when they're that person and they have that debt load, those, the $500 tickets to a concert they just were dying to see that they put on their credit card, they stole from their future self that at that time certainly doesn't think it's a fair deal. Yeah, or if they, dis or if they declare bankruptcy, to uh, avoid the consequences of their death, they're stealing from the people that built that capital in the past. That they're so either way, it's a, a losing proposition. Um, you know, I haven't talked about this for years, and I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember my friend's last name because it's been years since I've seen him. Paul uh, that wrote wrote a book on uh, retiring at thirty, and hmm. begins with a P T rather. Anyway, he was a uh, top accountant, a top accounting firm. And this was a long time ago. And he got fed up and he, because he saw that he was maintaining to, you know, to be a big deal accountant at a big deal firm, big house, paying the gardeners, expensive suits, expensive cars, blah, blah, blah. He said, this is no way to live. And he sold all that shit, just sold everything, everything, and uh, went to cash. And he's been living uh, around the world, uh, spending a lot more time reading books and playing chess, which he likes to do, and uh, seeing things that he'd never see if he continued to live in L.A., computing in, into the office uh, like a drone every day. Um, and that reminds me, there's another same era kind of guy, Jack Pugsley. Some listeners might remember Jack. I mean, we're very good friends. And uh, he had two New York Times bestsellers. One of them was called The Alpha Strategy, which I urge people to try to find. Difficult to acquire these days, but there, you, can, you can find digital copies of it around if you dig hard enough. Mm -hmm. And what Jack is basically saying is, you know, if you're going to continue living in normal society, you should do your basic savings with real goods uh, as opposed to money. In other words, uh, if they have a sale on light bulbs, buy a whole bunch of them, put them in storage. 
they're going to go up in price. If they have a sale on tools and nails and that kind of stuff. Buy a bunch of it. Uh, uh, this is for meta, all kinds of things. Uh, and you'll, you won't pay capital gains tax on the increase in value. And you'll have it when you need it. You won't have to go running down to the store. There's a whole philosophy about it. So you got to read the book. But uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question now or not with these examples. I think the core question was how much does someone need to call themselves middle class? And I think the uh, what we've been addressing is the other side of the equation, not income or cash in the bank, but instead the lifestyle choices that one makes that causes their nut to be so big each month that they have to overcome. It's a trap. And it's very easy to fall into that trap. So you've got to avoid it in order to uh, stay middle class because the middle class is, in fact, like Lenin said, being ground between the millstones of taxes and inflation. And it's mm -hmm. going to keep diminishing in the U.S. until there's some big change or not. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, if the central bankers are so obsessed with and confident in meticulous planning, why would they destroy their fiat currency system that worked better for them than anyone else could have imagined and replace it with a with programmable digital system, a CBDC? Because they have even more control, much, much more control with CBDCs than because it's a fiat currency too. It's just a digital fiat currency. So it's much more to their advantage. I mean, these, these, also these idiots have painted themselves into a corner at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a genuine, genuine ch chance that, you know, Argentina collapses because they destroy their currency and all the rest of this. That's bad for the Argentines, but Argentines have their money outside the country that they can bring back in and foreigners can bring capital in too. But this could happen on a worldwide basis now, and it could be a genuine catastrophe. So, uh, the, they have the, no, they, look, they're trying to keep the game going the best way they can, but we're dealing with, we're dealing with sociopathic people. We're dealing with actual criminal personalities. So it's going to end really badly. It seems to me the CBDC system is, it's like the timing of it looks like it's to be the replacement, to replace the a collapsed the, uh, Ponzi scheme that we have now with the, with the current monetary system. Maybe, you know, maybe it's just set up just to come in when, that's, when that, when that has, has reached its end conclusion. Yeah. yeah, and the average guy is not going to protest against it because he's going to say, gee, this is convenient. I can use my, my smartphone for everything, including my banking and welfare checks that they send me and this is this is great sad but true i think so okay so uh he says a bit of a loaded question but how does doug rate the average person's intellect today versus prior generations well you know it's sad well it's sad, but it's, I, I think it's a fact as far as i can determine that neanderthals had more brain capacity, larger cranial uh, capacity for brains than we do. Um, of course, we're somewhat, I mean, everybody but Africans worldwide are interbred with, with Neanderthals. So maybe they were a lot smarter than we were, although they didn't have the kind of technology that we have even 40,000 years ago when they disappeared. I don't know, are we smarter today or not? Well, look at Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. They're clearly as smart as anybody around today. Ancient Romans. Yep. Go ahead. I'm just digging something up. Like it, it could be. I mean, you can make the argument that people are getting more stupid because their attention spans are getting shorter. People don't read books, they watch TikTok and equivalents. And they're glued to their computers as opposed to looking at the real world, which people used to do. So I think the, the jury's out, but um, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? 
don't know if this is a great indication of it, really, but uh, uh, in Chris Weber's last newsletter, um, which I you know highly recommend, I think it's great. He goes through and he has a whole bunch of charts, uh, basically charting you know what the consequences have been since 1971, since our monetary system was shattered. And he has a lot of lots of it's economic. But it's not just economic. There's social issues in here too, like marriage declines, childbirth declines, divorces spike. And you can see this clear chart with all these things. Incarceration skyrockets. The the body of law explodes. The number of lawyers keep crazy. I mean, all kinds of things. He goes, and the charts are great. I highly encourage everybody to see it. I know. Um, but he also talks about, I think it kind of relates to that is he talks about, an, he shows an analysis uh, that political speeches now use simpler language and express more sentiment, more emotion. Uh, he shows a big steady decline in that, in at least political rhetoric since 1971, which would imply that people are, you know, relying on their feelings at least more than their intellect, because that's what, that's what draws the voters in. I think you could make a case for that. I really do. So, like most of the trends that are out there today, Hello. I hate to say it, but they're uh, they're negative. I mean, the only good thing that's going on, and a lot of it's being perverted and being used uh, towards what I consider to be evil ends, is science and technology is still advancing. Perhaps it's not advancing as quickly as it did. Maybe the rate of advance in science and technology has even slowed down. Um, yeah, so maybe uh, people are getting more stupid. It's like that movie, Idiocracy. Yes. Kind of took it to an extreme. But it doesn't feel that far off. I mean, with Fetterman, you know, with our president, I mean, uh, not our president, the president of the United States. The president. Um, yeah, Jeff, I got it right that time. Um, yeah, so I think that's, I think the good case to be made. I mean, it feels like that. And ultimately, you know, they want the the fake food and they'll just, everyone will sit in front of their uh, their screens watching silly, childish um, entertainment and sipping their sludge. Seems like it's on the way. Well, and maybe the quality of food is not what it used to be and you can't get proper nutrition for your body or your brain if you're absorbing all kinds of uh, sugar and degraded and refined carbohydrates, whereas in the past, people used to have real food with real vitamins and real minerals. Uh, and today, uh, yes, Wonder Bread, they say Bill's body, strong bodies, 12 ways. I shake not. So uh, over the long term, maybe this is a degrading influence too. Mm, that's a good point. So the next question, you kind of already addressed this, but I'll ask you again. Uh, what positive developments or news are you looking at? Uh, because oftentimes it's all doom. Is there any positive news or developments that you're seeing? Well, on our channel, it's basically all doom all the time. <laughs> it's nice to be on for something. Oh, look, all I can, two things that I can current events that are good. Number one, in El Salvador, which from my point of view of all the countries in Latin America was the shithole. It really was. It was the bottom of the barrel. But it got so bad that Bukele took over and maybe he'll be able to turn it around at least for a while. That's a positive thing. Uh, and in Argentina, the country which has done best on destroying what it had economically and socially and going downhill. It, it, listen, we can only hope that uh, Javier Millet will win the election and be successful in radically and actively reforming the place. These are positive things going on because... Well, the fact is he has, he has so much popular support there. So these ideas, which never get any voice, are heard and people love it. So I think that is a huge positive trend. Huge positive thing, yeah. So these two things and two unlikely places uh, are quite positive. And, of course, the other thing that I 
always hasten to add is that, you know, the uh, average the human beings, I mean, as degraded as many of them are, uh, are wired like squirrels. Produce more than you consume and save the difference. Put aside nuts for the winter, okay? And people do that in spite of themselves, even if they're nuts that they store are destroyed by the state. Uh, so, but they'll still do it. So that's a good thing. And science and technology is still advancing because there are more scientists and engineers alive today, uh, not in the United States, unfortunately, anymore, I don't think, but worldwide, than have lived uh, in all past history put together. So they're going to do clever things, hopefully. So those are some positive things. I'll add, I'll add one more. And I think that people are, are waking up to uh, 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 the false realities of some things. Like, for instance, uh, it has been assumed, because of this book we're working on, it's been assumed for so long that college was the only way to go. If you were a, a smart person with resources, that it was the sure path to success. And it hasn't been actually that way for probably a generation, maybe longer. And uh, I think people are waking up to that. I think people see it as the fraud it is that leaves people in indentured servitude thereafter. And, you know, and, and, if, and people see their children going away and coming back part of Mao's Red Guard. So I think that's a good thing. These illusions are being, are being uh, the bubbles are being pricked around these things. Yeah. That's a very definite positive thing. And I'll add one more. And it's that... Um... This kind of relates to uh, Malay and Argentina and uh, libertarian ideas, e even though they're not everywhere. But it used to be 50 years ago, libertarian ideas were few and far between in the population at large. Now, there are a lot of people that I know personally that are libertarians, and that didn't used to be the case, even though I was actively looking for them. When I was out of college or in college, you couldn't find them. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely changing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, who is the single most dangerous person alive? Or if that's too hard, maybe the top three. Well, dangerous. It's not going to be some common criminal. It's not going to be some, some Mexican drug lord. I mean, forget about that. That's, that's ridiculous. I, if I had to put my finger on somebody, I would say Der Schwabenklaus and, and his little pet court intellectual, uh, noble, whatever, Harari. Harari. Yeah, whatever. And all those people that are in that group, they seem to have some kind of power over the people that go to Davos where they can get them to all think alike and do evil and stupid things. So I'd put, I'd put him number one. And high government officials everywhere, I mean, no point in naming them because they're, they're, they're like important NPCs that you can replace with, with, with another evil drone, ones that run the EU and the US and Canada, all the countries in the world, most of the countries in the world. But uh, I don't know. Uh, Am I missing? Am I missing the real Doctor Evil out there someplace? Um, if there is a real Doctor Doctor Evil, I'm sure we he wouldn't be visible to us. But I mean, whoever I think Klaus is is kind of the marketing arm of you know the, this globalist stuff. You know the corporate marketing arm. But uh, certainly, the, just the forces that want this globalist stuff, basically, that wants you know they want to. You know the 2030 initiative. This is 17 sustainable goal. However, however, that's getting disseminated. It's so weird everywhere, yeah. and so broadly. So whatever's behind that, whoever is uh, publishing those papers, I mean, it's that's yeah. the problem. Who came up with that cockamamie date that they all are pushing? Like 2030. I mean, we could put our finger on that as the date of the apocalypse. So frankly, because they all like 2030 so much to do all these insane things. Mm -hmm. Who is, who is it that's pushing it? Yeah. And Der Schwabenklaus is just like a, a front man, maybe. I don't know. 
Yeah, you know, it's there's it's there are no real charismatic leaders out there, at least in the Western, you know, the Anglo Western globalist sphere that are leading things. And normally, you know, you paint the bad guy, a Stalin or an FDR or someone like that. But everyone, most of the leaders seem like they're just bureaucrats, you know, following a plan. I don't want to necessarily say it's all a plan, but I mean, that's what it seems like. So there isn't like the evil guy you can point to. It's a system almost. Well, let's hope that that's a further piece of good news. The fact yeah. that yeah. these people, the bad, the, the good news is, that, you know, they're not, they're really stupid non-entities. Bad news is because they are, maybe they can be replaced interchangeably. So I don't know what lesson we're going to take from our message. Okay. Just a couple more questions, a little more complicated. So this guy, he says he's a youngish, youngish guy with a family, no debt, smart, good for you, a decent job, but it requires uh, your, you there all the time. Uh, and he makes an income of 120000 a year. And he's got $2 million in liquid cash assets. Um, what do you invest in? And do you have, he says, do you have a good side hustle business idea? And how do you take that to the next level? Oh, uh, first of all, congratulations. I mean, I mean, that's formidable. That's great. Um, as far as the side hustle business, I don't know. There's so many of them. I, I suggest what you do is keep this thought in your mind. What goods and services can I provide to the market? What do I know? What can I do that other people might want? Yeah. How can I market it to them? I mean, it, just keep that in mind all the time and something's going to occur as you're yeah. looking at everything and thinking that way. And, uh, what investment? Well, you know, we talk about that in our file, file group yeah. and there are things that I think make sense today that are conservative that are, or let me put it this way, low risk and potentially very high return. They really are. Oh, uh, there are stocks out there from companies that are yielding, you know, shockingly, 10, 15% or more, very depressed, very cheap by all, I think could be explosive on the upside and probably not too, not too risky on the downside. I'm, see, I'm always looking at all big, the biggest lesson I've got, well, a lot of lessons, including stupid mistakes, I try to Remember those because we all keep making mistakes. But, you know, it's when I bought those South African gold stocks in 1976, dead flat at the bottom. And it was the smartest thing I ever did. I wish I'd done it with, you know, I wish I'd somehow sold everything I owned and put everything in that. And anyway, so I'm looking for things. I'm looking for a replication of hmm. Okay. Time. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, the most of uh, the, when I see that number, he talks about, and again, I felt the same thing. I thought he's doing a lot of things right. If he's been able to be debt-free, have a family, family and accumulate resources like that, that's fantastic. Yeah. I think when I saw that at first, I thought of your often repeated phrase, um, which isn't yours, comes from someone else, I believe is, you know, in a depression, the winner is the person who loses the least. That was so Richard I, Russell that said that initially. But so that that's my I worry. Want to keep the meme going. I want to keep the meme going because he was right. Okay. Yeah, and I think so. Like that's so you have to be careful these days. And you know, you've done all as you've done. You don't want that to be lost through the turmoil that's coming. You know, through inflation and tax increases and a market wipeout of some kind. I mean, you have to be very intelligently positioned, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. Don't, don't make a stupid business or investment error because, you know, many years ago, I had a pretty fair amount of money. And not only did I lose it all, I lost 150000 bucks I didn't have. And in today's dollars, that's well over a million. And I had to pay that back. So I was in back of the eight ball. I mean, from being pretty good to, not just zero. Yeah, don't let that happen. And it can happen. Hmm. 
Okay. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, this is another similar one. He says, Hey, Doug, I'm in mid my mid 20s. I'm a guy with about a million dollar net worth. Most of it's come from uh, crypto and other speculative plays. I'm currently exploring options to set up my first venture overseas. Very concerned about my inexperience and making local connections and deal making. Any advice on wooing notable officials to get your foot in the industry that has lots of government red tape? Um, and then he says, and I asked him a follow-up question. I'm like, can you give me a little more about your background? Like, uh, you know, you know, what are your skills? And have you traveled a lot? Because he's looking at international stuff. And he says he's he's an American and currently he says he's traveled, but only for leisure and, and nowhere off the beaten path. In the future, he plans to spend significant time in on the ground in Belize, Honduras, and India, Thailand, and Laos. Well, well, those places are reasonably developed, and you're going to have a reasonable amount of competition from people like yourself, which wouldn't have been the case 50 years ago, but it's much more the case now. So maybe you ought to go to places that are further down the food chain. Mm -hmm. Now, where might that be? Oh, uh, I'll tell you something that kind of has my attention. It's uh, the South Pacific. I'm thinking about places that nobody thinks about. Sure. I'll give you two examples. I'll give you the, uh, the Solomon Islands, which is only, any, if anybody knows about the Solomon Islands, it's only because the big island is Guadalcanal. Okay, so uh, that's a good place that's got resources that, uh, you know, these people are going to need some help dealing with them. Uh, Chinese are moving in there. And another interesting place is if you're looking for, you know, the new things that are as developed as the places you mentioned, uh, I would go to uh, the island of Bougainville, which is very close to the Solomon Islands, part of um, Papua New Guinea. But here's the interesting thing. They have a deal. Uh, it's an interesting story about Bougainville and Papua New Guinea. Uh, but they're going to be independent in, I think the deal is like five years from now. And this is about the most primitive place in the world. So I would, I would go there and get to know the locals. We're going to need a lot of help. And there's going to be a lot of what we call Uhuru jumpers that are going to be trying to take advantage of them. Um, and if you want to deal in resources and trees, fish and things they have, government officials, I mean, oh, oh, I hate to say it, but you may have to deal in favors. Uh, well, the kind of stuff. That, take a lesson from Hunter B Biden. Hunter Biden. Try to be a little bit more smart and ethical than Hunter. Yeah. Okay. All right, good, Doug. That was fun. Uh, we'll leave this there. We'll see if this video gets us our third strike on YouTube. And if, uh, well, whether it does or not, again, encourage everybody, if you enjoyed this, definitely go to dougcasey.substack.com. Sign up for the email list so we can stay in touch. Thanks very much. Duper duper. Thanks. Bye.